voice and I know them. Okay, so he ties hearing his voice into getting to know him. Okay, John, First John 5, 20, very important, all right? We know him and we are in him. This is the understanding that he came to give us. There's a number of different voices that God uses to speak to us. One, number one voice is his word, okay, certainly. And then we have speaking to us by his spirit, by other people. Certainly, peace is a, is a good voice that God uses a lot. So, and also laying on of hands is a doctrine of the church. And... Uh, Three of the five things that Jesus told his disciples to do in, you know, included laying on of hands. It's used in casting out devils. It's used in speaking in new tongues. And it's used to lay hands on the sick. So, very important. Okay, this is the last class. Class number six, we're going to look at spirit, soul, and body. Okay, and um, on your handout, on the... On the the timeline there, you see two examples of spirit, soul, and body. One is three circles, and the other is uh, a circle divided into three parts because you're a three part being. All right? You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a physical body. So we're going to look at that and then also talk about renewing the mind. Okay, let's look at this thing called the spirit first. First Thessalonians 5 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray your whole spirit and soul and body. Definitely says we're a three-part being right there. Be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. A. We are a three-part being consistent of, consisting of spirit, soul, and body. That's everybody in this room, okay? You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. The B, the real you, okay, is your spirit. That's the part that God placed on the inside of you where you get your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your personality, okay? All right? The, okay. The real you is your spirit, and you have a soul. That your soul is your mind, your will, and emotions, and you live or dwell in a body, which is also called a temple, Okay, B, uh, C, our spirit contacts the spirit realm, our soul contacts the mental realm, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and our body contacts the physical realm. Ephesians 2, 1, and you hath he quickened, made alive who were dead in trespasses of sin. Where were you made alive at? You were made alive in your spirit. Okay, you, nothing happens to your soul when you receive Jesus. You know, you were still goofy, all right, after you received Jesus in your head. And all that has to be changed. Your spirit became alive. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in and takes up residence. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Okay, you're brand new. A, your spirit, which was dead, was recreated and made alive unto God when you became a new creature in Christ. When you said those few simple words, Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Your spirit was made back alive unto God. And you now are a new creature, a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he says, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. All right? Jesus was sinless. And he says, why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay, righteousness is not just doing righteousness, but it's also a position, a position that you obtain when you receive Christ. A, we were made righteous, okay, in our spirit, okay, you were made righteous, whether we accept it or not. Some people have a problem with that. You say, oh, they're saying, oh, that's, that's a pride, ar prideful, arrogant thing to say, that you're the righteousness of God. Well, it isn't because the Bible says it. Okay, it's not prideful and arrogant. It's in the Bible. Accept it. You're righteous with God. To not accept it, you, you're like slapping Jesus in the face. All right, the Bible says we are seated with him in heavenly places, so accept that. Don't run from that. That's, that's a good thing. It's not a prideful thing. All right, Jesus paid for a, a horrendous price for that. All right, B, we can never be more righteous than we are at the new birth. And that's true. Okay, he doesn't impart more righteousness into you. You are righteous. Now, can you walk more righteously in the earth? Certainly. All right, but you're never going to receive more righteousness than you did when you said, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. You're taken out of the kingdom of darkness, placed into the kingdom of his dear son. Holy Spirit comes in. You can't get more of the Holy Spirit than what's on the inside of you. Okay? 
So certainly you can grow you know, in acts of righteousness, certainly. But you can't become more righteous than what you are at the new birth. John eleven twenty six. Jesus said, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He's not talking physically. He's talking spiritually. Because we know believers are going to die should he tarry. So he's got to be talking spiritually. When you're spiritually alive unto God, you're not going to die. All right? Death, spiritual death has passed from you. All right? Uh, a, a person's spirit can never die or cease to exist. It's spirit, spirit and soul. Okay? They can't, you know, change. Okay? They can't cease to exist. They just go to another place. B, in Luke 16, 19 through 31, uh, that's the, the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, the rich man fared sumptuously every day, had life pretty good, and Lazarus would come and just beg of the crumbs off the table. Lazarus, the Bible said he was, he was uh, full of sores, and he was a beggar. Amen. And uh, later on in that account, it said, Jesus said, Lazarus received the evil things in this life. Amen. Well, what was Lazarus? He was sick and he was broke. Jesus said he received the evil things in this life. So we know from those verses that sickness and being broke are evil things. Those are things that Jesus came to redeem you from. Okay? Now, Lazarus died and went into, uh, on your timeline chart here. If you want to look at the bottom right hand corner, this is death in the Old Testament. Okay? When a, a believer in the Old Testament died, okay, he, he either went down into hell where there was torment on the left there, and then there was a gulf there between them, or they went into Abraham's bosom if they were a believer. Okay? Lazarus went into uh, Abraham's bosom. He was comforted. The rich man went into hell and he was tormented. All right? They didn't cease to exist. They just went somewhere when they died. You're going to go somewhere. You're going to go up to be with Jesus. You're going to go to be in the presence of Jesus as believers. Unbeliever will go to hell, suffer in there in torment, be resurrected one day, and then be cast in the lake of fire. It's not pleasant. All right? I'm glad you're a believer here this morning. Amen? Okay. Um, Okay, in Luke 16, 19 through 31, both the rich man and Lazarus continued to live after death. They both did. All right, C, God has brought new life to our spirit. Now we have to deal with our soul and our body, our physical body. And you're going to deal with that the rest of your life, your mind and your body. D, the words spirit and heart and soul are sometimes used interchangeably. Yes, they are in the New Testament where some people believe that we're just soul in body. And, and I, don't, I don't have, you know, major qualms about that. But the spirit and the soul, definitely, there's a connection between the two. That's why I put that little arrow in on that diagram on the timeline sheet. There's a connection between the two. And the Bible says the Word of God can differentiate between the two. So, but you are really a three-part being. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather... They spelled that wrong. To be absent from the body and... To, maybe the King James does spell it like that. I don't know. <laughs> absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's what happens at the point of death. You're absent from your body and you're present with the Lord. Philippians 1, 23 and 24. For I am in a strait betwixt two. Paul here, he had a battle going on on the inside of him. What was the battle? Well, he was in a strait betwixt two things. Having a desire to depart and to be present with Christ. All right, that was his desire. He wanted to end this thing and go to be with Jesus. Okay? Or, he says, which is far better than remaining here on earth. Then he says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh or the body is more needful for you. Paul had a decision here. He wanted to go and be with Jesus. Or he said, it's better for you. He said, that's far better. But he says, it's better for me or more needful for you if I stay here. Why, I can continue to lead you and teach you. All right, but Paul was in a, in a decision there. You know, death sometimes in your, you know, is a decision. You know, Paul knew when he was going home. And when he told Timothy, he says, uh, I am now ready to be offered at the time of my departure is at hand. All right, Peter knew when he was going home. Can you know? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about that, but you, God will show you the time or the season you need to prepare 
that you're going home. Get your lives in order. Get your household in order. Okay? You have a decision you, to play in that. You have a part to play in that. You can know. All right? God will show you. If he showed Peter, he showed Paul, he'll show you. Okay. Um, at the point of believer A, at the point of a believe, at the point of death, a believer's soul and spirit go to be in the presence of Christ. He, okay, write these scriptures down. Luke twenty three forty three. Jesus told the thief on the cross. He says, "Today you shall be with me in paradise." Second Corinthians twelve four. Second Corinthians twelve four. He, referring to Paul, was caught up into paradise, which he called the third heaven. Okay, that was where Paul was stoned at Lystra and was dead. And the Bible says the believers gathered around him and prayed, and Paul was resurrected. Okay, he experienced death. He was caught up into the third heaven. All right, he was resurrected. He came back. Okay, Acts 7, 59 through 60. Acts 7, 59 through 60. Stephen, here, calling upon um, God when he was uh, stoned to death, it says, Stephen, calling upon God, he said, what? Receive my spirit. And in verse 60, he said he fell asleep, meaning he fell asleep or he died. But he said to Jesus, receive my spirit. Almost the same words that Jesus said. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Okay? Stephen said the same thing. Receive my spirit. They yielded up. Jesus yielded up the ghost. Stephen yielded up the ghost. Even in judgment, even in judgment, Ananias and Sapphira. Read that account. Where's that? Um, in Acts 5, where Ananias and Sapphira had a piece of land, you know, and sold it, and they were supposed to bring it, you know, the money and lay it at the, the apostles' feet, and they kept back part of it. I mean, no, they did a bad thing. They communicated out of their mouth, from their heart, that they were going to give this money, whatever, into the church, all right? And they did it. They tried to be deceiving, right? Even in judgment, it says, Ananias yielded up the ghost, Okay, and then it says Sapphira did the same thing. She gave up the ghost. It wasn't God took them. You would think even in judgment. How many have ever heard, you know, God takes people home? All right, that's in the Bible. It's in the book of Job. You know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay, does God do that? We don't believe that. I mean, you know, Job had to repent for the things that he said about God. Read the end of Job. Read it in the Amplified Bible. He had to repent. He was, spoke things without knowledge. All right? We don't believe that God takes people home. He will receive them as they yield up that spirit that's on the inside of them. That's why some people fight so hard to stay here in this life. I've walked with death through people who I thought were going to go home in a matter of hours, and they lasted three, four, five days. Why? Their will is involved. They fight to stay here. You know, God says, hey, I made this earth for you. We don't want to leave this earth. We fight to stay here. This is our, you know, this is a place that God made for us to have dominion and control and given us authority. And then he said, what? Be fruitful and multiply. We don't want to leave our families. We fight to stay here with our families, especially fathers. Okay, because why? They're caretakers of the home. They don't want to go because they feel that the family needs them to take care of them. We fight to stay here. All right? Praise the Lord. That's some good stuff. All right. All right, let's look at page number 25, this thing called the soul. Hebrews 12, 3. For consider him, Jesus, that endured such contra contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Word minds there is the word for soul in the Greek. All right, so we know he's talking about your soul. You, that's where your mind and your will and your emotions. Acts 14 in uh, verse 2, it says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds, or soul, evil affected against the brethren. A, the soul of man is really the mind or the emotional realm. All right, that's where you live most of the day. All your decisions come out of that, your head. If your head is wrong, your decisions and your actions are going to be wrong. So we need to get our minds Okay, renewed. B, it is also your control center where all your decisions are made. So if you're making bad decisions, okay, it's be, you're probably doing it with an unrenewed mind. So just get the, you know, get the word of God in there. You know, your decisions will be right. C, your actions come from your mind where all thinking 
all right, takes place. Depending on what books you read, you may have 2,000 to 6,000 thoughts go through your mind every day. I mean, that's a lot of thoughts. You know what the Bible says to do with every thought? It says to bring it captive unto the obedience of Christ. That is a major job with 6,000 thoughts. Some think it's more than that. Some think as many as 20,000. All right, you get to bring every thought captive unto the obedience of Christ. Why is that important? Because every thought has potential to do you wrong or good, okay? That potential is in, the in, in there with a the thought. And if you don't know how to throw thoughts out, then you're going to be, you know, wavering back and forth. You don't want to do that. As soon as you get an evil thought, and we all get them, okay? Nobody's exempt from sick, evil thoughts in this room. They're going to come because there's an evil, demonic world out there that tries to speak to you. And if it speaks to you loud enough and strong enough, it'll get you to think that you are that person. All right? That's the way he dominates and controls this world. He convinces people that they are something they are not and then gets them to act on it. All right? That's the way he does. And he has the whole six billion of the seven billion people on this earth. He has their minds captured. You tell me there's not a powerful uh, demonic forces out there that we are dealing with. Listen, we are no match for the devil up here in your head. In here, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Okay? But he's up here. He's more subtle than any beast of the field. All right? He can confuse you, get you to think wrong, especially if you don't have a renewed mind. All right? Your thinking is the areas he attacks most. Get your thinking wrong. Get you feeling condemned and that God don't love you. And so go out and act like this, you know? Don't let him do that. Nobody's exempt from that. D, this part of you was blinded by an evil world system to keep you from the light of God's word. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. All right. Write this scripture down. I believe this is where all counseling takes place, has to begin at this verse. Proverbs 23.7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he, referring to man. As you think in your heart, so you are going to be. So when a person comes down in my office and is seeking counseling, I know the first thing that I need to do is get them to think right, put new thinking in their mind, because they've just been thinking wrong, and they're acting on that, making wrong actions. All right, let's look at this thing called the body. Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And what then man became what a living soul. James 2 6, for as the body, your physical body there, without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Okay, when your spirit and soul leave your body, your body's gonna go limp and there's gonna be no life in it. And also remember Adam, you know, he was just a hundred pounds of clay from that song, right? That's I'm just kidding, but he was just a pile of dust until God did something. He breathed into Adam and then he became a living soul. All right, he put a spirit in Adam, and he breathed life into him. All right, A, the body had no life in it until God breathed life into it. Okay, then it became a living soul. B, the body is simply a house where the spirit and the soul dwell. Okay, it's called a house. It's also called a temple, a tabernacle. All right, the Bible refers to it as, as those house, temple, tabernacle. But it's just simply a place where the Holy Spirit can dwell. And the Bible says your, your, your body really is a temple, and it's supposed to be holy. Okay? You're not supposed to be taking this body and laying around with harlots and homosexuals. Okay? That's what the Bible teaches. You know, the Bible says you become one with who you lay with. Think about that. Okay? Your body is a temple. God only dwelt in God glorified temples in the Old Testament. They were filled with gold and good things. Okay? He dwells in precious places. He wants your body to be that same way. The Bible says to glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are Lord's, which are uh, God's. Your, your spirit, it, your body doesn't even belong to you. Okay? You need to be taking good care of that body. It's a temple. Look at the temples in the Old Testament. You know, look at Solomon's temple, all the gold that went into that thing. All right? God wants to dwell in good temples. 
Now, don't go out and start swallowing gold, okay? Don't do that. You come and give me that stuff before you do something foolish like that. Praise the Lord. All right, your body is a temple, though. All right. Oh, I hear I'm getting ahead of myself. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Look at the context, what he's talking about there. Read that when you get home. He says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They both belong to God. A, our body is the temple of God for God to dwell in. B, our body should honor God. Okay? Should honor God. Okay, let's look at this thing called renewing the mind. Okay, renewing the mind. All right. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world. That's what you were doing before you were a Christian. You were conforming to the world, whatever the world was doing. All right. But be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind that you may, may what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. You'll never know the good and acceptable, acceptable and perfect will of God until you get your mind renewed. That's and it's only going to come from the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 4.16 for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, talking about your physical body, it's in perishing mode. It says, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That means you should be feeding that inward man on a daily basis, day by day, putting something into your mind out of the word of God. Colossians 3.10, and have clothed yourselves with this new spiritual self, which is ever in the process of being renewed and remolded into fuller and more perfect knowledge upon knowledge after the image, the likeness of him who created it. Man, I'm glad I don't have to memorize scriptures out of the Amplified Bible. All right, but it's talking about getting a renewed mind. All right, you're putting a new image up in your mind. A, our minds have to have a complete new way of thinking because God's ways are totally opposite to the kingdom of darkness we came out of. All right, the kingdom of darkness said to hate. All right, God says to love. Kingdom of darkness says keep and store up for yourself. God said to give it away. Kingdom of darkness says hit, get, strike back. All right, Jesus, Jesus said to turn your cheek. Those are opposites. The kingdom of darkness is opposite of the kingdom of God. Okay, B. We never really know the will of God until we get new knowledge in us. And that's true. That's why it's important why you come to a class like this and others that we offer. All right. To get your mind renewed. C. Getting our minds renewed is a daily process. That's right. Should spend some time every day in God's word finding out who you are and what Christ has done for you. What he's imparted to you. D. This is going to take a dedicated effort on our part. Yes, it is. It's going to take some work. The Bible says to study to show yourself to prove not to God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, that means you're going to be a laborer. It's going to take some work. All right, you need to be in that bookstore, buying books and studying, reading, taking Pastor Jerry's messages and putting them in your heart so they can start to produce in your life. Okay, um, E, we are to learn that God's image is now our image to attain. Okay, uh, page 26, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. What did he predestinate for you? It says to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus didn't want to walk this earth alone. He's got wanted many brethren to walk it for him. That's you and I. We're to do the works of Jesus now. A, God had pre-planned beforehand that we are to renew our minds to think and act like Jesus. Pre-planned, think and act, okay? He, that was before the foundations of the earth were laid. That's how he thought. B, Jesus was the first, all right? Jesus was the first to be our example to conform or change into. You can follow Pastor Jerry and other leaders but you don't conform into their lives, okay? You conform into the life of Jesus. But he's also put men and women in the body of Christ for you to follow. But you don't conform your lives into them. It doesn't say to do that, but you can follow them. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that, following individuals, if they're the right individuals, okay? All right. See, it must be possible if God said it. Yes, he wouldn't have said it if it wasn't true or possible. D, 
it would have to be possible to love and to preach and to heal and do all that Jesus did. Yes, yes, and amen. All right, anything Jesus did, you are capable of doing the same thing when he puts you into a situation like that. Even if you needed to walk on water, you could do it if he puts you in a situation. Or you could speak to a storm. Did Jesus speak to storms? Yes, he did. Can you speak to a storm? Yes, you can. You have Bible for it. Jesus did it, you can do it. I mean, we just had some severe weather here just the other day here in Michigan. You can speak to storms like that, that they don't come near you. Okay? Why? Because Jesus spoke to storms. All right? That's that image he wants you to conform into. Okay, E, the devil will do all he can to keep this knowledge from you. Yes, he will. He wants, he shudders at you when, when you come to church and you hear the word. Okay, you get him scared and shook up. And then if you want to petrify him, you put that word down in your heart and become a doer of that word. That's what he fears most. You becoming a hearer and a doer of God's word. Because he knows now you're going to go out and help others to do the same thing. He don't care. He'll let you come to church and hear sermons for the rest of your life. As long as you don't act on them. But when you start to act on them, now you become his biggest threat. He don't want you hearing to begin with, but he'll allow you to hear and just, you know, talk you out of it, you know, before you get out in the parking lot sometimes and get to the restaurant. He's very active at that time. F, once you have this knowledge, and, and really, once you have it and act on it, you now become a great threat to the kingdom of darkness. Okay? You become a big threat to him. Mark 4.15 says Satan comes immediately to steal the word. That means he's very active here on Sunday mornings. Okay, he's trying to steal the word as Pastor Jerry tries to plant it in your heart. And he'll take it away from you before you hit the lobby, if he can. All right? Comes immediately. Immediately means right away, doesn't it? Okay? All right, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Again, another scripture out of the Amplified. And all of us, with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the word of God, as in, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into his very own image, <clears throat> in ever-increasing splendor, and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is that spirit. A, the word of God is like a mirror, which reflects an image to the believer. Okay? B, this image is what we are to transform our own image or thinking into. And that's true. You get the transformation that takes place. C, we are to grow in this image from one degree of glory to another. Another verse here, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. A, the Holy Spirit will help you in renewing your mind. He'll bring those scriptures to your mind when you need them. All right, when you're witnessing and think you've got nothing to say, God will just pour some scriptures through you supernaturally. And it's an awesome thing. You'll think, what do I got to tell these people? All of a sudden, stuff will start coming. Especially if they are receiving you, God will just pour through you stuff to say to them. All right, you don't have to worry about your own ability. He don't want you acting in your own ability anyway. He wants to speak things through you. Okay, B, he will reveal. Did I, do, I, did I do A? The Holy Spirit will help you in renewing your mind. Okay, that's one of his responsibilities. B. B, he will reveal this image to you and remind you of it when you need it. Okay, Let's look at this. Some things to look at and understand. Read Matthew 16, 13 through 23, and you'll see that the Apostle Peter received the greatest revelation to the church. What was that revelation? That Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the next few verses, uh, have him saying a thought influenced by the devil, that Jesus would not be crucified and be raised from the dead. Jesus said to his disciples, Who do men say that I am? Some said thou art Jeremiah, Elijah, or whatever one of the prophets. And he says, yeah, but whom do you say they am? Peter said, thou art, the son of, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. He says, for my, um, my, father, my, my father has spoken this to you. Okay, he got the greatest revelation to the church, Peter did. Then if you read, continue to read 
the, you know, in the following verses after that, Jesus explained to his disciples he was going to go into Jerusalem and, and, and uh, suffer things, uh, you know, at the hands of men. Peter jumps up and said, basically, he said this, Oh, no, Lord, not on my watch. I'm not going to allow that to happen. Jesus looked at him and says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things which be of God. Now, look at this. In one minute, Jesus is receiving. Peter's receiving the greatest revelation to the church, and in the next minute, he's getting a thought from the devil and speaking that out. Okay? Now, why am I saying that? Because you can be in that same position. You could be receiving from God at one moment, in the next, receiving a sick thought in your mind, and it's not you doing that. I want you to understand that. A number of years ago, my wife and I decided to look at some of these videos my son was bringing home, okay, from work. You know, these people would record movies and all that, and then, I mean, you're not supposed to do that, and then give them out, you know. So we started looking at some just to see what, what he was looking at, all right. We, we looked at some, just kind of scanned through it, you know, this one was all right, this one's all right, this one's all right. And we come to this one, we start watching it, you know, and Pastor Darrell likes those uh, um, Jason Bourne movies, you know, kind of stuff, those, you know, I Spy stuff and all that, you know. So we got interested in this movie. We started watching it, you know. We're watching it, watching it, watching it, you know. All of a sudden, this superhero guy, you know, he's talking to this woman in a bar, okay, in a, rest, a bar, a restaurant, or the mo a hotel. And just like this, that quick, the next scene, he's upstairs with her in a, in a, in a room, and she pulls off her clothes, and she's, you know, naked. You know, my wife said, get, get that out, grab that, you know, get that remote and all that. You know, we shut that off, so we tore that up, okay? That was on a Saturday. Sunday morning, I'm s standing up over here worshiping, all right, worshiping God with my eyes closed and everything, trying to connect with God. And what comes into my mind, all right, that movie and that thought, okay? I'm not exempt from that, and you aren't either. So you can get a thought from God in one minute and get a thought from the devil in the next. That's why you got to get this thing up here renewed so you know the difference. So you can throw one out, keep the good, and cast out the bad. Nobody's exempt from that. That's the way he manipulated you before you knew God. He trained you. He put thoughts into your mind to, you know, that you're going to be a thief, a liar, you know, an adulterer. All right? He formed you and manipulated and controlled you to do, to get involved in those things. All right? So, nobody's exempt from that. Okay, this last page is how to resolve conflict in the church. Just read that. Something very important on Pastor Jerry's heart. Matthew 18, it tells you how to handle situations when you have a disagreement with another uh, believer. Okay, very important, you know, that you walk in forgiveness with people. And they with you. All right, somebody does you wrong in the church or even outside the church here. Okay, you're to go to that individual and get that thing straightened out between you and him alone and not on the telephone, okay? You don't call up others and say, oh, brother so-and-so did this to me. You know, he's a nasty guy. You don't do that. You put wrong thoughts of an individual, you know, of a brother into somebody's head. You shouldn't be doing that. You go to that person and get it straightened out. If you can't get it straightened out, the Bible says just take somebody with you, a mature individual, see if... You know, you can't get it straight now. If you can't get that still straight now, you take it to the church. Okay, you come and bring it to me, and we'll, we'll try and, and get it uh, straightened out between you two. Because you want to walk in forgiveness. If you don't walk in forgiveness, read Matthew 18. It's critical. All right, people that don't walk in forgiveness go into prison. They go into be tortured of the devil. And Jesus said, so my heavenly Father will do to you if you from your heart don't forgive. You'll go into torture. You'll be tortured. The devil will have a heyday in your life. And he's not going to stop until you forgive an individual. So it's one of the most important things we can look at if destruction is in our lives. Am I harboring unforgiveness against anybody? All right? And then the goal is always Galatians 6.1. Somebody overtaken in a fault. All right? You go to that person. You restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You don't go there in judgmental attitude. You go in the spirit of meekness. Okay, there's a ministry, entry, uh, um, ministry forms, okay, that you were all given. If you know the area of ministry that you feel that you want to go into, fill that out. And you can turn it into, there's a little slot in the uh, uh, wall behind the information booth. You can fill it out and drop it in there. You can give it to me. And uh, it will make sure that it gets to the department head. You have now finished first principles class. You're allowed to work in the church and get involved. And so... Um, 
We thank you for, for doing that. We thank you for your time. I hope you learned a lot of stuff today that you can use. And um, uh, don't forget to continue and go on with the rest of the journey. In the next uh, journey class, which is called the Road to Service, you will get a spiritual gift test and a personality test to determine where your gifts and talents are. And that'll help you in finding God's plan for your life. And then in the third one, Road to Maturity, uh, you will learn more uh, meat of the Word of God, things like church authority and gifts of the Spirit and stuff like that. All right? All right. Thank you very much. God bless you. And have a wonderful day.